Thank you. Welcome back. This is session number four of the 2017 Virtual Genealogy Fair. It is entitled, entitled A is for Archives, B is for Burn File, Accessioning Burn Files at the National Archives at St. Louis. And our speaker is Ashley Cox. Within this presentation, Ashley will talk about the 1973 fire at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis and discuss which files were burned and how their designation changed from non-archival to archival, making all burn files available for research relatively soon. This talk has exciting information for both beginners and experienced researchers. Ms. Cox is a preservation specialist who works for the National Archives at St. Louis, Missouri. I am turning the broadcast over to Ashley Cox. Hello, uh, I'm Ashley Cox, and I joined the Preservation Unit at St. Louis in December of 2016. Um, I was previously the Conservation Librarian at the University of Pittsburgh for a grant project stabilizing large-scale coal mine maps. I moved from one very unique set of documents to another. I knew my experience with the dirty and fragile maps would translate well to our work here, but I was not prepared for the sheer amount of requests that our technicians deal with on a daily basis. Next slide. Next slide. All right, here we go. Uh, the following presentation is broken into three parts. We'll talk about the 1973 fire and its aftermath, requests and the archival research room, and finally, the preservation treatment process, including our newest innovative process, content recovery scanning, leaving time for questions at the end. Next slide. In the early hours of July 12, 1973, a fire erupted at the National Personnel Records Center in Overland, Missouri, in, the, in St. Louis County, just outside the city of St. Louis. The fire raged for four days, and a total of 42 fire districts participated in the quelling of the fire. The fight was complicated by overwhelming flames driving the men from the, entering the building and continuing water pressure problems. Over the coming weeks and months, the record center and other government agencies would work together to salvage records and identify any information they could to help supplement the lost records. Next slide. You can see the heat of the fire by the warped steel shelving seen here. Surviving records were frequently protected by the buildup of standing water from the firemen's efforts as well as the ash from outer records. Next slide. The amount of water used to fight the blaze combined with the hot and humid St. Louis summer created the perfect environment for mold growth. Thiamol was used to try to mitigate the situation somewhat. Records were collected, sorted as best as possible, and then stored into egg crates, almost 30,000 of them. Records were vacuum dried in a chamber at the McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Corporation that had originally been constructed to simulate space conditions. After the test runs, additional chambers were used at two different facilities. The technique was successful, but because of its experimental nature during the first run, the documents were slightly over-dried, increasing the brittleness of the paper. Next slide. So what is a B-file? Similar to Sesame Street, the government loves talking about letters. B is for burn file. Our computer inventory system, or registry, assigns file numbers with a letter prefix. These prefix letter letters are an easy way to reference an entire record group. A new registry was created to organize the damaged files and thus the B files were born. You can see the, per the branches most affected as well as the personnel and periods affected in the chart on the slide and the estimated losses. Approximately 6.5 million survived, and while that may seem like a lot of records, when compared to the percentages of records lost, it becomes clear how much of our history was damaged that day. Click, please. Within these, it can be hit or miss what survived. For a personal example, my great-grandfather's record no longer exists, while my grandfather's does. And that's with the same last name. Next slide. So here's your typical B file, burned, brittled, and distorted with broken fragments. A record in this condition is very difficult to use for research and can be damaged with repeated handling if it is not stabilized. But what if your record was completely destroyed? 
next file. That brings us to our other registry created from the fire. NARA worked within its own holdings in cooperation with other agencies and in some cases through donations from citizens to help create the R files or reconstructed files. R files are typically thin with copies of older documents or contain modern correspondence about the veteran. Next slide, please. Now that we have covered the background information, let's talk about using these records for research. This is the typical journey of a record destined to go to our on-site archival research room. Request, search, record review, archival determination, treatment, the archivist, and then finally you. Don't worry about understanding these somewhat confusing terms. I will cover each step. Next slide. So how to request. If the government loves using letters and acronyms, there's one thing it loves even more. Click, please. Forms. Next slide. You can request by mail or online using the SF-180 or online via eVetRex. Um, this system creates a customized order form to request your or your relative's military personnel uh, records. You may use this system if you are the military veteran or the next of kin of a deceased or former member of the military. And you can have a definition of that um, online at our website. Uh, for archival OMPFs, you can e also email or write, um, or, next slide please, you can come visit us in person. With the fire damaged areas fixed or removed, the facility at Page Boulevard in Overland was used until 2011. The Federal Records Center, now located in Spanish Lake, was dedicated in 2011 and is delightfully fire-free. Next page, please. But there are still forms. Um, when emailing, make sure to give as much information as possible, especially with common names. So for my great-grandfather and my grandfather, there's not a whole lot of Vinicasas in the building. Um, but if I were to look for my father's record, there are literally thousands of Coxes. Um, uh, when you arrive, you'll have a short orientation process that explains the ins and outs, and then you get a super cool research identification card. Next slide, please. So planning ahead. Why are appointments so important? Well, if you're a walk-in with no previous appointment, they try to get the records to you within two hours, but there is a limitation on the amount of records you can request. Additionally, if your research falls within the fire affected records, we need to find out if it still exists, if it's archival. If it's not yes archival, you'll have to be the veteran or the next of kin, and what treatment it will need from our department. Next slide. Once the records you need are identified, it is time to get them from storage. We have a total of 15 bays, each three stories tall, but the first floor is double, so it's essentially four stories worth of records. The B files are isolated into two bays with a designated entrance and exit to minimize any possible contamination of the facility. The low temperature, 50 degrees, as well as relative humidity, help keep the mold dormant. The files are pulled and delivered to our lab, which is located at the entrance to the bays. Next slide, please. Next comes record review, or as we refer to it, mold ID. Record review is the process of us identifying the type of request and whether the amount of mold, debris, and any other damage requires us to treat the record. Some records can be handled by specially trained staff outside of our department. All research room requests are treated by the preservation staff. From October 2016 to April 2017, 29,028 records, and a daily average of 207, went through record review, while 1,234 of those had to be treated by preservation technicians for access issues. Once we have determined what level of treatment the record needs to receive, next slide please, we send it to one of our research room colleagues for archival determination. In 1999, the then Archivist of the United States, John Carlin, announced that, announced that the veteran records would become permanent. In his speech on October 20th to the House of Representatives Subcommittee on Government Management 
Information and Technology on the Committee of Government Reform, he said, because of the great value of these records to our history as well as to individual veterans, they will be accessioned permanently into NARA's holdings. And because of their huge volume, these records will require a new facility with archival climate controls and security. But the poor condition of many of these records requires that we institute an immediate and comprehensive program for their preservation. Records become archival 62 years after separation from the, mil the military. This can be tricky in some cases because many service members joined re reserve units setting back their archival dates. My grandfather, whom I mentioned earlier, was discharged in September of 1957. He has previously used our EVETREX system to request his DD-214, but in 2019, myself or any of my cousins could request to see his record for our own genealogy research. Archival records are then returned to lab for treatment. Researchers are alerted if their requested records are not yet archival. Next slide, please. So let's take a brief moment to discuss how we track records through this process. AIC, the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works, is the national membership organization for conservation professionals in the United States. It has more than 3,500 30, 3, conservators, cultural heritage professionals, and institutions dedicated to strengthening our ability to care for our collective heritage. The AIC Code of Ethics outlines responsibilities and rules that all conservation professionals should follow. Items 1 and 7 specifically deal with the principle of documentation. With billions of, of records located at the NPRC and 44,547 records reviewed and 1,468 inputted through preservation in fiscal year 16, documentation is important not only for knowing where the record is at in lab, but the treatments performed. Next slide, please. CMRS, or our Case Management and Reporting System, is used center-wide. It tracks request dates, if the record has been searched and pulled, where it is in the building is located, some requester info, like the type of request, and what staff person is in charge of the record. It also helps create our search sheets with the record location in the building with and with several football fields worth of storage. That's pretty important. Next slide, please. The treatment tracking database is our department's internal tracking system. We can track the main info of the record as well as its location in our lab. Eventually, we hope to have this integrated into CMRS to increase our transparency to others within the building. Next slide, please. Next is our treatment tracking log, which is help generated by our database. The tracking log is a standardized way to capture the treatment info across the hundreds of records we treat a month and the multiple staff members that can work on the same record. Next slide, please. Once checked into preservation and paired with its treatment log, the record goes into our first treatment queue, surface cleaning. Next slide, please. While the thymol solution was used to try to reduce mold growth, many records still became moldy. When you think of mold, you might think of the fluffy green stuff on Tupperware that has been sitting in the break room for too long, or the dreaded black mold that's spoken about on the news. Mold can come in a variety of textures, fluffy, feathery, even hard, small, pebble-like structures, and a variety of colors, too, including green, white, black, even purple and bright pink. Surface cleaning attempts to remediate this mold growth. It is impossible to completely remove or kill mold spores, but remediation attempts to reduce inactive mold buildup as much as possible. Additionally, during surface cleaning, we remove staples, debris, excess ash, and any other rusted fasteners. We get quite a pile of staples and paper clips by the end of the day. Next slide. Preservation and conservation uses a wide range of tools, many adapted for them from their original use. The Shuko vac is one such item. Designed for the medical field, it was originally an aspiration and suction device. The gentle suction allows us to remove mold residue and debris from the surface of the paper. We have a variety of attachments, but the most heavily used is the brush. The soft bristles lift the mold, which is immediately sucked into the filtration system. 
The canister is filled with a water and enviricide mix. Enviricide is a medical grade disinfectant that kills, well, a lot of stuff. Other frequently used tools include soot sponges, which are also called dry cleaning sponges or chemical sponges, which is a vulcanized rubber that leaves no cleaners or residues. They can be cut down to size and the debris is trapped on the outer layer of the sponge, meaning they can be repeatedly trimmed and used until they essentially disappear. We have a variety of brushes in different sizes and bristle stiffnesses, which also help loosen and brush away mold and debris. We have bone folders, which yes, are made of animal bone or horn, or we also have non-stick Teflon versions to help smooth out creases and folds. Our whole bean offset spatula is thin and flexible, making it perfect for separating apart pages that are fused or lightly stuck together. The lifter, also made of non-stick Teflon, is one of our favorite tools as the smooth bezeled surface can glide between even more delicate and stuck pages than the whole bean can. And while only one size is pictured here, we have many shapes and sizes of micro spatulas. These workhorses can help separate pages, support pages when turning them over, and removing the vast variety of fasteners that we encounter. Next slide. B-file triage. The B-file triage room and decontamination lab, aka decon for short, have the most activity with records before and during remediation. Average mold levels are similar to that of the outdoors, but the types of mold are different. Aspergillus accounts for the bulk of the decon's mold activity. We know this because we conduct air quality tests. Our most recent test was in March of this year. You never become immune to mold. Your sensitivity only increases over time. Because we are handling the records, especially while surface cleaning can increase the amount of mold spores in a small area, we wear PPE, or personal protective equipment. Staff throughout the building are given access to PPE, including gloves, smocks, aprons, sleeve covers, hair nets, shoe covers, and masks. We offer preservation staff, staff fit testing for half mask respirators and have a variety of disposable respirators to fit various face shapes. Air scrubbers and purifiers clean the air in areas with high B-file usage, and we have fume hoods in both our decontamination room and our wet lab, the name of the area where we perform treatments using any kind of water. Next slide, please. Many records dried into a distorted and twisted mess post-fire. During the surface cleaning stage, technicians use a variety of micro spatulas and lifters to separate as many pages as possible. These distorted pages, once clean, are put into our humidification queue. While taking patience and skill, records must be cleaned before undergoing the humidification process. Though only in the dome for a short while, we do not want to risk the mold reactivating. We must remove as many of the spores as possible. Next slide. While currently 80% of our workflow focuses on the treatment of requested B files, we do repair and inspect records that have, been, that have not been affected by mold. Whether they have been requested from other record groups are for large scale processes, like we are currently humidifying um, a large run of JAG records, or during processing and rehousing. The mold is inactive and the spore count greatly decreased, and we want to minimize the B files interactions with these other records. Next slide, please. We are constantly looking for and learning new methods to increase our speed and efficiency without sacrificing proper handling of the records. We have increased the efficiency of our humidification treatment through the use of two humidity domes that were shown, one on this slide and also on the previous slide. Previously, we used a method called tray humidification, which was very passive and took several hours. The domes must be closely monitored to prevent oversaturation, but humidification in the dome takes roughly only 25 minutes, depending on the atmosphere in lab and also the quality of the paper. Next slide, please. This is the same record before and after humidification. Dubbed the football, it was the subject of one of our most shared Facebook posts. We frequently encounter records with this level of distortion. Humidification helps make the information accessible while also decreasing the physical size of the record. As we all know, space is at a continuous premium and it is no different here. 
This record, with pages mended and many sleeved in support of polyester, will more easily fit into our permanent storage with no damage to itself or other surrounding records. Next slide, please. Along with heavy distortions, we frequently encounter torn and fragmented records. This photo comes from a training session earlier this year where some of our conservators from the D.C. area lab came to train us on new mending methods and also paste creation. Next slide, please. Another instance of time efficiency, we only mend records where the pieces are completely detached or where the tear impedes the ability to read the information. Pages with shorter tears are sleeved in polyester L sleeves. The film creates a small static charge which also helps to hold the records in place. Pieces are matched, and next slide please. Reattached using conserv gra conservation grade adhesive and Japanese tissue. The conservation field uses this long fibered paper made from the Japanese Kozo plant because it is thin but strong and has no lignin. Lignin is a component found in wood pulp based paper that turns acidic and brittle. While the tissue is a constant, the form and adhesive changes. At the preservation lab, we do three main types of mending. The most used is tissue with wheat starch paste. The paste is made in lab each week. We cook this highly refined starch with deionized water and become, until it becomes a translucent tacky paste. The photo shows the paste being strained through a norikoshi or horsehair strainer. This helps remove lumps and creates a more consistently textured paste. We also use remoistenable and heat set tissue. Both of these have adhesive pre-applied. Remoistenable tissue also uses wheat starch paste, but is first diluted with another conservation adhesive called methyl cellulose. The mixture is applied and allowed to dry. The tissue can then be remoistened with water at the time of use. Heat set tissue generally has a thin layer of an acrylic adhesive that reactivates with the use of a solvent or tacking iron. These tissues can be bought or made in-house. Next slide, please. The moistened men strips are ideally applied to the back of the document. If there's information on both sides, we choose the side where the information is least affected. The page may then be sleeved in polyester depending on the fragility of the paper. The photo on the right shows a page where the entire right corner has been reattached using Japanese tissue and wheat starch paste. Next slide, please. Starting in October 2015, the lab began a process to digitize badly burned records that previously would have been considered completely inaccessible. Utilizing infrared photography, which has been around on film for, since the 30s and 50s. This is done digitally though. Due to volume and request deadlines, we needed a reliable and repeatable method. Previously, each page would have had to have been painstakingly manipulated uh, with photo editing software. Our new system allows for pages to be scanned and ed edited at an average of less than one minute per page. Next slide, please. So how does it work? There are different spectral properties between paper and the various inks. The absorption and reflection of these light waves creates contrast between the information in the page that we cannot see with our own eyes. Next slide, please. So what is a good candidate for content recovery scanning? Um, this photo is a perfect candidate for it. Um, the information cannot be revealed using a normal copier. Um, there are printed or typed inks in it, which uh, helps with the way the light bounces off of the two. Um, there needs to be a high amount of dark brown to black charring into areas of information, so we can't actually see any information there with our own eyes. Um, and the, one of the most important things is that it's brittle and the fragmented charring would be damaged if we even sleeved if we repeatedly handled that record. Next slide, please. Here's our setup using our infrared camera, um, a snapshot of our Capture One software, and strobe lights. The placement of the strobe lights is important as many of these pages have to be supported in mylar sleeves. Poor placement or timing of the strobe would create a glare. The initial photo with the infrared lens is bright magenta, but that is not how we would deliver it to you. Next slide. And here are the results. You can see the dramatic difference in the amount of accessible information. And we have applied an additional digital filter to create an easy on the eyes gray scale image versus bright pink. 
As of this month, we have used content recovery scanning on almost 300 records that would have been otherwise unaccessible and unusable. Due to these records' very poor condition, they are not physically accessible for researchers. If requested, the digital copy is delivered, helping keep these especially fragile records from being repeatedly handled and damaged. Next slide. Finally, each record has a final inspection by a preservation specialist before it is picked up by our archivist. Next slide. After being uh, utilized in the research room, uh, it comes back to us um, in B files. Uh, we consolidate the veteran's records. Sometimes a veteran may have multiple B or R files due to the salvaging process. These are generally treated all at the same time so they can be bind into one S file or safeguarded file. This creates a more efficient search for any future requests. Uh, next slide. If you want to learn more about conservation, whether here at NARA or just in general, um, please visit our webpage. Uh, we also have a Facebook and an Instagram um, that one of our technicians is uh, on the committee for, so she does a really great job. Um, there was also the very first presentation from today was by Katie, one of our conservators. And then there's also a link to AIC's main website, and there's a handout for this presentation that has these links as well as links to the forms that I referenced. Um, next slide. And so now we're ready for uh, questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. People are just overwhelmed with the work that uh, the National Archives has been doing. So as we prepare for the questions, just some of them, uh, the comments I'm looking at, they're saying, this is just amazing. Uh, wow, incredible. So very, very appreciative of the work that you've done. And we so, have labs here, and then we also have um, two in DC. So DC area. So it's not just us here. We do lots of great work for all of NARA's collections. Wonderful to know that too. So let's dive into these questions. Um, let's see here. Someone that actually uh, says she handled separations during the Vietnam War and was required to send a copy of the DD-214 to home of record county. So shouldn't they have been recorded in county records? So in theory, they should be. Um, unfortunately, not every veteran um, listened to those instructions. <laughs> so, um, or there could also have been fire and floods. A lot for a lot of county courthouses, the records are located in the basement, which is a main area for flooding. So it's possible that those are also lost there, but that is an excellent place to go check if your record has been affected by the fire. Yeah, uh, several people have asked, you know, would you suggest sending in another request for records due to the new technology if the request was a long time ago? I suggest yes, um, especially because, because of the salvaging process, we find what are called um, inner files or partials within records. Um, so if you had a similar name or if the records were really piled up, they would just be scooped up and put into a folder and then dried. And as we treat those or do other reference cases on them throughout the building, those get pulled out and we actually have a process um, where we research those to see if they have a file here, and if they don't, then we create a file. And sometimes they might be rather small, but there is more information. Um, but that does take a lot of research work, so we have a lot of partials that we're continuously identifying and creating files for. Okay, so a follow-up question. Uh, someone says that they uh, sent in a request just this summer and got back minimal information. Uh, so does that mean nothing else was recoverable or that more might be forthcoming? It sounds like, should we actually just wait for a, a few months or a year before asking for information? Um, that's sounds, a difficult yeah. question to answer, um, depending on if it, if it was in the fire-related cases. A lot of times, you know, we give you 
everything that we can really find. Um, at least or we repair what we, what we can give to you. There are instances where stuff is badly fused together and we can't get those pages separated. Um, so unfortunately, sometimes it is just a minimal amount of information. Okay, thank you. Um, I got a question here uh, from someone about a naval re reservist. Would a DD-214 be issued for a Navy reservist? Going back to our previous discussion. Um, that would be a question for one of our archivists. Uh, mm -hmm. Would it? Would one? Yes, they'd be issued. DD-214s weren't standard until the 1960s. So if okay. it was beforehand, it would have been a separation document issued by the Navy. Okay. So DD-214s weren't um, done till the 1950s, and before that would have been a separation document issued by the Navy. So thank you to our archivists that are sitting in the room <laughs> to answer that question for me. Right. <laughs> we have a lot of information. Um, next question. Someone had asked about unit histories. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they weren't sure where, which uh, building in the National Archive system had unit histories. Uh, it might be go back to one of the archivists in the room. Someone proposed that it was in one of the Washington, D.C. buildings for the unit histories. Yeah, that's possible. Um, there are also some here. Um, the Preservation Department doesn't see those very frequently. We have morning reports for the Army. Oh, we do have morning reports for the Army. Oh, and preservation has helped uh, with the microfilming of those. So, yes. A one and A two. It's largely going to be an A one and A two, which is our DC area. Okay, thank you. That is helpful. Um, someone had uh, mentioned. I thought we should address about when when to do a FOIA. Uh, someone had written as a helpful comment for those of you looking for records which may have been burned. I had success finding a lot of records by sending a FOIA to the Regional Veterans Off Administration Office, and I know uh, I thought it, it might be a better way than to put in a FOIA for these burned records, I think there might be an easier way to access those records rather than going all the way through the FOIA process. Um, yeah, if it's, if it's archival, then you can, you don't need a FOIA for it. Um, you just request it through the reference department. Thank you so much. Let's see, I'm going back through some of the questions that we've got are about basic how the federal government operates and, and how, we're, how we're budgeted. So I suggest uh, that we go to our website, uh, archives.gov, for those types of questions. Thank you for those. It's always fascinating. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions that pertain to your particular topic, except I just want to say again how incredibly uh, grateful people are for your work and all of the, the preservationists who are bringing these records back into a condition that we can actually read. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for your work.